Well, good morning. Can you all hear me? Great. Shane, thank you for that very kind introduction and welcome. Uh, you are all the early birds uh, to this conference and uh, others will be joining us as we uh, progress, but this is always a great event and I'm uh, pleased to be able to participate it again this year and I want to especially uh, thank Shane, uh, uh, Tim Lohr, uh, Tim Lorden, uh, where's Tim? He's, he's in the back making sure things are going right. Uh, he does a great job as the executive director and uh, Jerry Berman as the former executive director and founder of this organization, uh, dedicated uh, not to uh, lobbying the Congress about individual pieces of legislation, but to educating the Congress about the legislative issues surrounding technology uh, and all of the important uh, constitutional principles that surround uh, the use of technology. They do a great job of making sure that members and their staff are given the opportunity to participate in a whole host of uh, uh, events where they hear from uh, some of you and uh, about uh, the great issues of the day and then legislative initiatives hopefully will evolve from that uh, and with a better understanding of the impact of technology on uh, our lives. So uh, year after year, the industry and government leaders come together to discuss the pressing issues that impact the internet and its users and today I have the privilege of introducing to you uh, Lior uh, Lior Div, uh, who co-founded Cyber Reason, a cybersecurity startup which utilizes military-grade technology to stop the world's most advanced cyber attacks. Lior is an expert in the fields of hacking operations, forensics, reverse engineering, malware analysis, cryptography, and evasion. Previously, Lior served in Unit 8200, of the Israeli Intelligence Corps as a commander of a cybersecurity team where he received a Medal of Honor for his excellent achievements. Prior to co-founding Cyber Reason, Lior founded a cybersecurity services company that provided services to Israeli government agencies. The growing challenges consumers, businesses, and governments face today are greater than ever before, especially with the advanced capabilities and techniques illicit hackers are able to leverage to infiltrate networks across the globe. That's why it is important now, more than ever, to ensure we continue to work collaboratively in finding ways to deter and prevent hackers from infiltrating networks that maintain everything from our nation's electrical grid to our personal information. And that's why I'm excited today to have this candid dialogue with Lior, whose company partners with companies such as Lockheed Martin, SoftBank, and Wipro, uh, to ensure the most advanced cyber attacks are countered with the most advanced cyber defense mechanisms. That's something we want to learn more about today, and that's why I would like everyone to join me in welcoming Lior Div. <laughs> Lior, welcome. Uh, is there anything you'd like to uh, uh, start out with uh, saying before we get into a few questions that we have for you? First, uh, I wanted to thank you, Mr. Chairman to invite me here to this forum. Um, I am honored to be here, and I think that the, the topic of cybersecurity is extremely important, as you mentioned. And let's jump into it. Get right into it. Yep. So first question, does the rapid growth of cybersecurity uh, and the industry that surrounds it reflect the growing number of cyber threats that we face? Oh, yeah. So uh, I like this question a lot because the answer is, is easy. It's absolutely yes. Um, from what we see in the past few years, and I can give a few examples about it, uh, we see a rapid growth in the sophistication and the motivation of hackers around the world. And in very, very high level way, you can divide it into two groups. One is a state-sponsored attack that we see more and more and more. And the other one is criminal that we see more and more. Just the fact that ransomware uh, become uh, basically a business model that hackers are using in order to uh, gain uh, control and collect money from individual pe uh, people. We see a growth in the past uh, three years, basically from 2014, si uh, 15, 16, and so on. We see a huge rapid growth of the use of ransomware in order to collect money from people. So this is j just one example. Of course, when it go to the state sponsor attack, uh, we believe that more and more country, and this is something that we see, using those type of attack in order to collect espionage or, or to use it for espionage manner. Well, it seems that everybody who's involved in uh, hacking of various kinds uh, 
uh, various types of uh, cyber attacks are becoming more and more sophisticated. Uh, is that true, and what uh, do we need to do in response to that? So uh, I, I think that the, there are still groups of, we call it the uh, script kiddies, basically people that know, don't really understand that the nature of the beast, they don't really know how to use a like, sophisticated tool. But on top of that, I think that there is, and uh, this is something that we see every day in our customers, there's see a growing use of more sophisticated tool, but that basically leaked from the government or, or other places into the commercial slash to the criminal world that people are starting to utilize it. In general, what we see is that more and more criminals are starting to become a pro when it's come to cybersecurity, meaning they learn the topic, they, they use the new tools, and actually sometimes they're inventing a new method in order to use them. So I think that we can see the growth of sophistication that goes very, very rapidly in the past, I think, two years, very aggressive. So um, it, it seems that uh, many people who are hacked, have data stolen, may not even realize the data has been stolen or realize far too late. And there are obviously some very high profile examples of that uh, with, for example, the uh, Democratic National Committee, uh, just as an example recently. Uh, what uh, can uh, entities like that, private businesses, government agencies, political organizations do to be more aware when they are getting these kinds of attacks that something actually uh, is going wrong? Is there technology to be deployed? Are there things that can be done to counter some of this sophistication that is developing on the side of the hackers? So first I think that um, what we need to do is, uh, and this is the time to introduce the IT security versus the cyber security kind of mindset. The IT security mindset is the old mindset that you can create a, a, a wall and everything outside the wall is protected and everything inside, uh, it's not safe, sorry, and everything that inside the wall is protected. Those, those there are, are gone. Meaning we move from IT security to cyber security when if somebody wants to hack, meaning to get control on your system, he will be able to do that. Sometimes it will take more time, but the mindset need to be changed to be um, a mindset that if somebody wants to hack and to get control on your system, he will be able to do that. And in this kind of new world, you, after you change the mindset, you need to apply technology that assumes that if somebody wants to get in, he will be able to go in, and then what? Basically, then the technology need to assess the environment every time, 24 by seven, again and again and again, and answer basically a very simple question. Are we under attack right now? Meaning, is there right now an adversarial activity inside my environment? And if the answer is yes, to be able to really understand everything that's going on, it's like the military, to get the situational awareness of what's going on. Once you understand that, then you can foil or eliminate the attack. And that is attainable by the average uh, business, the average uh, uh, organization, or the average government agency, they can get that kind of situational awareness? So uh, I think to change your mindset, this is something that related to education. We as a company pushing the agenda and you, we are speaking in these forums and other forums in order to, to help people to change the mindset. So this is one thing that I believe that there is a lot of information that exists out there that every chief security officer can educate himself and the company and the CEO and the board member. And when it's come to technology, I think that in the past three years, we see a rapid growth, growth of startup that introduces a new ways, actually cutting edge way and technology in order to deal with the problem. Just for, for um, an example, in Cyberism, we try to use every technology that was exist out there, big data, AI technology. Then we realize that the technology that exists today, it's not enough. So we spend more than two years to develop a, basically a new technology, a new big data technology, to be able to implement the solution that we are selling today. So there is a new cutting edge technology out there that can enable a chief security officer to deal with the problem. I think that uh, it's always been the case, but I think following some of these recent cyber attacks, that do not seem to have a profit motive, it's become more and more apparent to people that people engage in, in uh, cyber hacking for a wide variety of, of reasons, not just uh, to make money. Some uh, uh, simply want to test uh, the, uh, uh, the quality of uh, system 
And uh, actually, when they find weaknesses, they'll report them to the company that provides that uh, software or other uh, uh, technology service. Others uh, have uh, motivations uh, political, mm -hmm. uh, as we've seen. Uh, and of course, uh, theft of large quantities of data for, uh, for profit reasons or targeting an individual uh, to uh, relieve them of some of their assets uh, are all things that people worry about increasingly in our society. Um, have you encountered any state-sponsored hackers while conducting systems analysis on your clients, IT infrastructure, while you're doing it? Mm -hmm. So Cyberism today is a global company that have um, access to company across the world, uh, all the way from uh, many companies here in the state, Europe, Japan, and other places. Um, in the past, uh, more than three years, we managed to uh, show again and again and again two types of, of group of attacks that we managed to find. Uh, one is criminal, of course, um, that have the motivation there is generate revenue and money. But the other one is, in some cases, pure espionage, meaning that you can see that this is a, a well-thought um, attack that is targeted to collect a specific type of information from a company that um, there is no commercial, basically, for criminal or, or, or motivation for criminal to attack this company. Uh, I think that uh, in the past few years, we've become more and more uh, sophisticated in our ability to assess and understand what's going on inside the companies, meaning to be able to go all the way from the single byte that uh, those hackers collected to who is the adversary and what was their motivation. And I think that uh, by now, today, the answer to your question is absolutely yes. Uh, we saw many uh, type of attacks that didn't come from just specific uh, country, from different country, and some of them can be uh, surprising. Which types of threats concern you the most? So I think that it depends in which industry. Uh, but the, the most is the type of attack that actually can use software in order to generate uh, destruction in the real world. And because when it comes to collecting information, espionage, this is something that it just evolved during the years. Meaning that at the old days it was spies, today you're using software in order to do that. But this day I think that we managed to prove that you can use software as a weapon. And basically I think this is kind of, if you think about the ranks, this is the top and most dangerous one. Because once a country uh, decided to use software against other countries as a weapon, this is not different than uses missiles and other uh, techniques. And so uh, shutting down the electrical grid, uh, causing a nuclear power plant to malfunction, uh, causing a meltdown on a financial uh, exchange, those are the sorts of things that uh, we should all be the most concerned about? Yeah, I, I think that, the, and we can go on and on and on with right. examples because there are many type of examples. And even the non-obvious one, you can shut down stoplights in a specific area and create it uh, and, and direct the traffic and then create uh, whatever you want to create, basically move people from one area to another. There, there is a lot of uh, subtleties and sophistication that cybersecurity is introducing versus regular weapon. Have we seen any examples of either those on a large scale or smaller scale? I, I think that... Or the, they've actually... Uh, done some of those things? So the answer is yes. What we see that um, uh, a few countries changes their uh, way of attacking uh, a real attack, starting with the cybersecurity attack to paralyze, let's say, the electrical grid, and then to use a real power in order to conduct their operation. Right. But have we actually seen that happen, say, in any country, but particularly here in the United States? So I don't think that we have a specific example here in the state. We have kind of indication that maybe, but it wasn't a clear cut. But um, I think that the day will come. But the prospect of, for example, uh, a protester, mm -hmm. we've seen plenty of those around here uh, uh, this, uh, this past weekend, uh, attempting to change the, the traffic pattern by manipulating mm -hmm. the, the traffic system, uh, that's a real possibility of yep. occurring. Yeah, I, I think that it all boils down to the motivation, meaning who is behind the scene and what is the type of motivation uh, they have. What I don't think that we have a clear definition today, um, what is an act of war? 
So in the old days, there is a very clear definition. When it's come to cyber, there is no clear definition of those type of attacks. You mentioned ransomware yeah. uh, to, to change the subject a little bit, uh, which has come up more recently. A number of people, uh, even some of my constituents, have experienced this. Uh, is this a serious ongoing concern, or is it the fad of the day? So I'm smiling because uh, five years from now, we see the, the raise of ransomware. It started. And for us, it, uh, we, we thought about it. This is not a real cyber attack. Meaning a few computer was uh, encrypted, and that's it. Um, in the past three years, what we see, we see a growing business model when it's come to ransomware. What does it mean? Meaning the combination of the ability to encrypt file with the combination of using a Bitcoin together, generating a new business model for criminal to generate a lot of revenue. And suddenly what we see, we see more and more groups out there using ransomware in order to just generate money. St instead of stealing it, they just using this method. So it's become, the phenomenon becomes so big right now that we believe that there is more than a one billion dollar that was generated using this method. So I don't think that this is just something that it's here and it will be gone. I think that this is something that it's here and it's gonna stay because the business model works. So as people get more sophisticated in trying to stop that, the criminals will again get more sophisticated and find new ways uh, to uh, grab control of your, uh, uh, your computer software mm -hmm. uh, and deny you access to it unless you pay them a ransom. Yeah, that, or threaten to destroy it. Yeah, that, that's the reason that, um, you know, in cyberism, we created a free tool that everybody can use. And if you think about it, it's outside of our business model because we are focusing on enterprises. But the problem is so big that we said, if we're not going to do something about it and going to contribute our ability and, and knowledge into this area, it will be basically impossible. So basically, this is a free tool that available to everybody. Person, uh, personal people um, to companies, small companies all over the world. And people started to use it and we started to calculate the amount of dollars and we introduced it last month and we started to calculate the amount of dollar that we managed to save to people by being able to stop this phenomena. Uh, I think that this is something that we're doing as a one company but this is something that everybody needs to do together uh, in order to push this agenda because that's a real thing. Where is cybersecurity headed? Uh, what concerns are there with the Internet of Things and the use of wearable technology? If you look at the future and even in the near future, everything is connected. People used to say everything will be connected, but everything is connected today. But the fact that everything is connected, um, if you think about uh, Internet of Things, I think that we should think about security of things because you can Basically, my thermostat at my home is connected to my computer, connected to a camera, connected not to the ref refrigerator yet, but it will be connected there. So it's, everything is, is connected. So if somebody really wants to get control and to hack, you don't need to use my cellular phone and, or my PC anymore. You can use all the other thing as a surface to attack and then leverage this in order to get control. Um, how can the public sector better connect with the private sector in addressing uh, problems like this? What's the best role for Congress in facilitating this kind of collaboration? We have, as you know, a great deal of concern on the part of many of our constituents about uh, their privacy, the protection of their civil liberties, uh, but they also want to be protected from uh, various types of uh, criminal attacks, and uh, finding the right combination uh, is something that... Uh, is, is very important for the Congress. What's your view of how that should head in the future? So I think that for many years, the government agencies and, and the government in, in general around the world, not just here in the state, uh, was a closed garden when it's come to security and especially when it's come to information security. I think those days are gone. I think that uh, we see a change in the uh, willingness to cooperate between the government and, and the private sector. And I think, Mr. Chairman, that uh, you mentioned it uh, uh, when you were discussing about encryption. Uh, and I think that you are more expert than I am uh, about it. <laughs>
Well, thank you. Thank you for the observation. But and we are very concerned about this. We have uh, established a, uh, an encryption working group. Uh, it grew out of, of course, the uh, dispute between the FBI and Apple uh, over access to the, uh, uh, the smartphone of, uh, of the uh, attackers uh, in uh, California uh, who engaged in a terrorist attack, and many lives were lost. Obviously, the FBI wanted to find out and find out as rapidly as possible if there were any co-conspirators, any people still out there that they needed to be aware of, uh, and they ha encountered a problem. Uh, but Apple also encountered a problem uh, with the FBI's initial solution, which was uh, create uh, a backdoor key that we can get around the uh, encryption, uh, the rather basic encryption device to just open up the, uh, the smartphone. Uh, and Apple uh, response was, if we do that, we're going to jeopardize hundreds of millions of similar devices around the world. Uh, because once that key is out there, it's available to anyone. The trend in the industry is obviously in the opposite direction, which is to create devices that nobody has a key to, and that has its own share of problems. What are your observations about that? So it is a complex uh, issue, completely complex, because uh, as you mentioned, once you're creating an encryption or you close something in a way that somebody will be able to open it with a backdoor, it, and it doesn't matter what is the purpose that you did it, if the, let's say that the purpose was pure for the government or pure uh, for a good reason, hackers, their expertise is to be very, very creative and look for those holes. So if the hole, hole is created and it's there, they will find it eventually. Maybe they will not find it in the first week or month, but over time we saw it again and again and again that if there is um, a backdoor, it will be found and be, will be used uh, against the, the main purpose that it was created. So I think that the simple answer to just create a backdoor for somebody, it's not relevant anymore. We and agree. Yes. So as you mentioned, this is a very, very complex situation that we need to work together and cooperate between the government and the private sector in a smart way and not just in the very, very simplistic way. Um, and again, I think that that, that was covered completely um, <coughs> when you wrote about the encryption uh, and the Apple case. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, we view that as an interim report because we think this is going to be an ongoing, evolving problem, and <clears throat> there is going to be a need for the Congress to be uh, aware of uh, the, uh, the need for uh, some legislative solutions sometimes, but also the risks involved uh, if we undertake them and don't understand the ramifications of what we're doing. That certainly came up with regard to that. There were legislative initiatives offered, and so uh, in response, we offered this working group, which uh, it's my hope. Uh, and intention uh, will continue to do its work uh, in this new Congress. Uh, let's open it up uh, for questions from the audience. I'm sure we've uh, not touched on something you want us to. This gentleman right down here in the middle. Chairman Goodwood, you mentioned uh, the... Uh, Tell us all who you are. Oh, I'm sorry. Claude Marks with MWatch uh, News Service of, of Washington, Texas, and I was trying to find out a little more about what, what we might, might see from Congress this session on these issues, uh, Chairman Goodlatte. What, what will your committee be doing and what will your other, what will some of the other committees be focusing on? In this well, area? as you know, the working group that we've just been talking about here is a uh, working group of, uh, it's bipartisan. Uh, it was formed by the chairman and the ranking member of both the Judiciary Committee and the Energy and Commerce Committee, the two primary committees of jurisdiction related uh, to this issue. Uh, it's my intention uh, that we continue uh, with that work, uh, and we're now having discussions uh, uh, amongst the leaders of those committees uh, as to uh, how that uh, would best proceed forward. Well, I'm sorry, what about other tech policy issues will your committee be doing with uh, other We're things? going to be Pat, Pat uh, unrolling our entire stuff. tech agenda. Uh, in the near future, to this morning is not the time uh, for me to talk about all the different issues related, uh, everything from uh, uh, immigration to the Electronic Communications Privacy Act and other things. We'll, we'll uh, have a full discussion of that very soon. Way in the back, we have a hand. Uh, good morning. Uh, Alex Howard from the Sunlight Foundation. Uh, as you may have heard, uh, Politico reported that 
Uh, President Trump will tap Ajit Pai uh, to be the chairman of the FCC. Um, do you expect Congress to pass legislation regarding open internet rules on net neutrality? And if so, what will those principles be? I really appreciate the question, but we're really here uh, to hear from Mr. Div today. Uh, and there will be an opportunity very soon to have uh, a discussion about all of the various issues related to uh, the internet and the jurisdiction of the Judiciary Committee. But uh, I really would like to uh, respect uh, Mr. Div and his uh, uh, expertise in the area uh, of cryptography uh, and uh, keep the focus on that. I respect that, Congressman. In that case, I'll ask a follow-up directed towards him. Um, is it possible to have a secure backdoor, a so-called golden key, that government agencies have and not expose the nation's private data to potential hacking should that be compromised? Is it mathematically possible, speaking with your technical acumen, for that to occur, how should we be balancing the privacy interests of billions of people against the state's interest in gaining access to that private data? I think that's directed to you, Mr. Dib, but I also have an answer <laughs> for it. So um, I'll speak mathematically. Um, mathematically, I think that once there is a backdoor, there is a backdoor, meaning that somebody will be able to use it. Uh, when it's come to encryption, I think that it's uh, much more uh, complex than just talk about the mathematics. There is the way that you implement it, the way that you are using it, and the technology that surrounds it uh, in general. Uh, I think that the, the way that the industry goes is to create a situation that nobody will be able to open the encryption. Uh, when it's come to protecting everybody, I think that uh, it, it's very complicated, meaning that it's not a a pro-encryption or against encryption uh, topic, I do think that it's a complicated issue that uh, needs to be discussed, and I don't think that there is an easy or clear answer of how to do that. Yeah, and, and quite frankly, uh, I'm not sure what a gold key is, but I certainly uh, would question uh, who would have access to that, and uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, it existed in any form would make it in and of itself uh, the target of uh, people attempting to get a hold of it, uh, whether they are government employees or government contractors, uh, as was the case uh, with Mr. Snowden. Uh, and therefore, uh, quite frankly, uh, trying to set up a situation where uh, you always know that somebody else has a key in, in case something goes wrong is a very serious uh, matter that I think uh, would uh, likely jeopardize communication systems if we go about viewing it in that fashion. Uh, I think you have to think outside the box here. I think there are ways for, uh, for government uh, and uh, companies like uh, Lior Div's company uh, to collaborate on finding solutions uh, on what I think is going to be an ongoing problem, but to think that there is a golden key or a magic key or uh, something else uh, that would uh, solve uh, intelligence and law enforcement's problems and not uh, put at risk uh, the uh, safety, the security of, uh, as, you, as you call it, billions of people <coughs> uh, is, uh, is not a realistic way to look at this problem. I'm Mike Nelson. I do global public policy for Cloudflare, which is a web security firm. And I wanted to ask an international question of our speaker. This is a global problem. I'd be curious whether you can pick, point out two or three countries that seem to be doing the right thing, not only to protect the confidentiality of information online, but also to prevent DDoS attacks and to prevent manipulation of data and violations of the, the integrity of data. And I guess the related question, for both of you would be, is there something the U.S. could be doing to more effectively help other countries tackle cybersecurity issues? Definitely. Um, I think that what we see in the past uh, few years is uh, a, a growing evolution of understanding the nature of the problem. Meaning that uh, if you go back five years ago, people didn't use the term cybersecurity and they didn't know that this 
problem is exist. As I said earlier, people refer to security as IT security, meaning that if I will create a bigger wall or create a firewall between the outside and the inside, that will be enough. I think that this change, meaning that in the past five years, people are more and more edu educated, and I think that here in the state, um, the, uh, the discussion is uh, very progress, relatively very progress than what we see outside of the US. Uh, we have a foothold, and we have uh, the part of my company in Japan as well. I can say that Japan is probably two years behind the US, and then uh, Europe is around one year behind of the US. So I, I do think that the US right now, as a state, is very progress in the way that uh, we are thinking about cybersecurity. But it's not enough, because I think that the major problem that we see is about education of children. Meaning that right now, the, most of uh, the problem that we see in the industry is that there is a lack of people that they are experts in cybersecurity. Meaning that if you're not coming from the right three-letter agency, you don't know anything about cyber. You know probably everything about configuring security or IT security, but that's it. So I think that to educate people, to educate in the university about cybersecurity, not just the defense, defense and offense, and to explain and to teach people how to use this new technology, this is something that we should do and we, we need to progress in a more rapid cadence than we're doing right now. And I would just add that <clears throat> I think the U.S. has a role in, in many ways that is ongoing right now and should be stepped up in the future. But we work, I uh, am confident, uh, uh, very collaboratively with uh, organizations, international organizations and organiza international organizations like Interpol, Europol, uh, to uh, uh, discuss uh, various cyber threats and, uh, and share information that can be shared about how to counter them. Uh, we also work collaboratively with other countries, and I think that uh, technology companies uh, can help that because many of them uh, work around the, the globe uh, selling their services, and uh, that uh, sharing of information and that competitive environment also helps uh, to build new technologies like uh, uh, Lior's company uh, builds that uh, will, will benefit this problem. It is no doubt an international problem, the Internet uh, more than anything in history, uh, transcends uh, national boundaries uh, effortlessly. So uh, I think that uh, it is a serious problem. Uh, but we also have to look at this as a problem of uh, not uh, security versus privacy, privacy. In my opinion, it's security versus privacy and security, because uh, strong uh, technology keeps people safe. Uh, at the same time, it protects their uh, information, whether it be financial or health or simply private uh, communications. Uh, and that doesn't in any way diminish the problem that intelligence organizations and law enforcement organizations have uh, in their responsibility to prevent uh, various types of cyber attacks and other uh, physical attacks, uh, as Lior noted, uh, that are very much going to be increasingly related to each other. But we're going to have to do it in such a way that we respect uh, both of these goals. Rick? One quick question, and then um, if we have a congresswoman, you go next. Uh, real quickly, you mentioned that cybersecurity is something that's been talked about just recently five years, for the past five years. But in 2000, um, the U.S. Chamber put together a panel discussion on cybersecurity. We called it Cybersecurity, the Real Y2K Threat. Um, that was 16, 17 years ago now. How, one of the things that was interesting about the Y2K threat was the publicity. Businesses stepped up to the plate trying to fix it. There was a massive effort, and everyone was gung-ho about doing it. How do we get the business community to take that type of seriousness again with limited resources, but to realize that if they don't do these things, you know, we're all at threat from a cybersecurity attack? It's, it's interesting because uh, five years ago, I had a conversation with the it was five chief security officers from uh, Wall Street. And basically, they said, uh, cybersecurity, it's like uh, the government should protect us. Uh, I think that it was half a year later that the SEC asked them, what are you doing in order to uh, protect yourself? Um, so I think that right now, we need to create a situation that there is no the government versus the private sector. 
meaning this is the time that we need to start working together. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, you, you mentioned earlier about sharing information about intelligence. There is different group bad guys that exist out there. We know about them. We collect information on them as a private company. We share it with the government. The government should share information with us. Of course, not the top secret one, but there is many other type of information that can help us be better protecting those private companies. So I, I believe that when we will change the dialogue between the government and the pr pr private sector in general, not just uh, uh, companies like mine, meaning Wall Street and other companies, people will start to realize that this is an effort that we're doing together in order to solve this problem. Because this problem is not like the Y2K problem. The Y2K, it was one day and then it was gone. This problem is here to stay. And I think that it's right now uh, our responsibility to ten, change the dynamic and to make sure that everybody is working together in order to solve this problem. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just one final note. I want to put in a plug for your next uh, speaker. Uh, uh, Suzanne uh, Delvaney has been uh, a very valued member of the Judiciary Committee and very much involved in this issue, works in a very uh, bipartisan way on it. Uh, but she's also leaving the Judiciary Committee and uh, moving on. I can't imagine why, but there's some other <laughs> committee that she wants to move on to. But uh, she uh, is a, a great uh, a bipartisan advocate for work in this area. Uh, let's give Leo Ardiv uh, a round of applause. Thank him for coming here today. Thank you.